All glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hello, this is Victor and the Psalter. We call upon the Holy Spirit to guide us through this commentary on the Psalms through the, with the help of a commentary already well known for its wisdom by St. Augustine of Hippo. Hippo. Modern day Algeria. Anyway, um, this is the first in the series of psalms that are normally prayed during daytime prayer using the single volume Christian prayer book. Um, this is the single volume version of the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, it's very practical for lay people, and I highly recommend it. Um, the daytime prayers are very easy to memorize because we use a lot of the same psalms uh, throughout the week over and over again. So there isn't as much variety as there would be with the four-volume set. But that's good because it gives you a chance to really absorb the message of the psalm. Okay, let's get started with Psalm 120. If you'll notice, the psalms for daytime prayer are organized in numerical order from 120 to 121, 122, 123, 124, 125, uh, and so forth and so on. And this collection of psalms from 120 to uh, 128, if I'm not mistaken, are referred to as the gradual psalms in the Catholic tradition. Um, and so they often deal with um, everyday situations that we encounter in our daily lives, regardless of what our background is or who we are. And it's very appropriate that the Holy Spirit led the church to choose Psalm 120 as the psalm that's normally prayed at terse or at mid-morning prayer, which is normally around 9 a.m., three hours after 6 a.m. when we pray lauds. Uh, morning prayer. So mid-morning prayer. This is uh, um, when we are already uh, beginning our day, unless we work night shift and we sleep all day, but if you're the kind of person who gets up early in the morning to go to work, this is usually the hour when you pretty much know how your day will go. And so um, prayer is very paramount at this point. And in my case, I work as a high school uh, language instructor, which probably explains my over-pronunciation of everything. And I often turn to this prayer with lots of eagerness because usually by 9 a.m. that's when I'm usually overwhelmed with things to do and uh, situations that are common for those who are working in education. Anyway, uh, I will just read through it first, and then I'll comment on each verse. Again, I base my commentary on St. Augustine's commentary on the Psalms, so it's based on the Catholic understanding of the Psalms. Um, I'm not claiming to be the authority on the Psalms. Um, and the beauty of the Psalms is that people can walk away with different interpretations and usually arrive at the same conclusion. Um, so I won't even bother comparing it to other interpretations, um, but this is the one I choose because it's thoroughly uh, Christocentric and messianic in interpretation, and since I am a Christian, it's the route that I take. Um, but again, that's that's it's your choice on how you want to interpret it, but um, I just beg you to please interpret it in light of love and mercy because that's the key. And it's also the intention of the writer of the psalm. Okay, so anyway, um, unique to Catholic tradition is uh, we often begin with this antiphon to set up the mood for the psalm, where in the Easter season, so we would pray the three alleluias, which, as you know, is Hebrew for praise the Lord. And then we have a quote from the New Testament to emphasize its fulfillment in the New Covenant. Um... So it's very important that we understand that first quote from the New Testament if we're going to 
uh, understand the context of this, of this psalm. Okay, so be patient in suffering, be constant in prayer. That's pretty much the best way to deal with life in this world: to be patient when you're suffering, and to constantly pray. Because without prayer, if we rely too much on natural um, strength, it's limited. But with prayer, we're 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 accessing the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is uh, unlimited, and that's what um, aided many Christians through some of the most dire situations that uh, just didn't end until the until the day they died. Actually, um, so let's begin. So it says to the Lord in the hour of my distress, I call and He answers me. So, how many of us at mid morning? or find ourselves in distress, how many of us actually call out to the Lord? How many of us actually call out to God? Not vocally, but internally, interiorly, in our souls. And how many have, have experienced God's response? Now, now, when it says He answers, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, God will um, give you an audible signal. No voice is going to come from the sky, at least not most of the time. It usually comes in the form of uh, some unexplained consolation that cannot be attributed to just uh, psychological will. Okay, um, and then it says, "O oh Lord, save my soul from lying lips, from the tongue of the deceitful." How many of us have to work around people or be around people that we don't really trust? Um, how many of us find ourselves in hostile situations? So this is a prayer of someone in that kind of a situation. Okay, and what shall he pay you in return? So this is the psalmist asking the deceiver or the liar or the corrupt person, what shall God pay you in return, O treacherous tongue? According to Augustine, O treacherous tongue, it's a, a very forceful um, term, whether in Hebrew or in English, for someone who is not just lying to you, but doing so in a way that's very deceptive and almost comes across as consoling and positive. How many people are angels to your face and um, devils um, when you're not around? So he even likens this to someone who's a Christian and trying to live the Christian life and someone telling him, are you sure you want to pursue this because it's not healthy to uh, avoid casual sex. Casual sex is good for everybody. Just look at what pop psychology is saying. It's saying that it's good to release these urges and to be free and to be this and that. And I, I hate to limit this to just sex, but that seems to be the big thing now. Um, or why do you, uh, why are you so patient with him or her? If I were you, I would tell them off. I would, I would speak my mind. I would assert myself. And so, um, often Satan comes uh, under angelic guises. Um, his suggestions are often rational. For instance, if you're fasting, why don't you eat? If you're hungry and you're dizzy and you can't focus. Or if you are um, trying to live a chaste life, or trying to be faithful to your spouse, even though she may not be a nice person or uh, doesn't show any... Um, reciprocation, re, re, excuse me, it's late at night, um, reciprocation of your feelings, and you, you're tempted to have an affair with someone who shows a lot more sympathy towards you, someone who you connect with, um, the devil's going to come in and say, hey, you know, you, you have a right to happiness. Happiness is good, right? Um, and then if you follow through with that, you run the risk of wrecking your covenant with your wife, and if you have children and ruining their lives and, and having them live in a divided house. So you see, that's how Satan operates. It's usually something that makes sense to the secular mind. It makes sense. But the commandments of God ask us to think above human reason um, because God is above human nature. He calls us to be divine. And so... It's better to sometimes follow without asking, as long as it keeps you in a state of grace. 
And then it says the warrior's arrows. This is what he will repay the treacherous tongue. Warrior's arrows sharpened and coals red hot blazing. At first when I used to read this, I used to think it was um, a literal statement that, you know, uh, somebody who's treacherous is going to be shot with arrows or um, singed with uh, red hot coals. But um, there's a lot of symbolic language here. In the scriptures, arrows can sometimes also mean the word of God. It could also, in the coals and red hot, red coals red hot blazing could also mean uh, prophecy. So this is the wisdom of the psalmist. He says, uh, he will repay the treacherous tongue, not with violence, not with physical violence, but with this, the word of God, with, this, with spiritual wisdom that can only come from the Holy Spirit. Um, if you remember the story of Isaiah, when he beheld the holy, um, when he beheld the majesty of God and the cherubim, um, and his, there was a hot coal that touched his lip, which allowed him to prophesy. Um, this is this is it. It's the same symbolism. So it's not like Saint Augustine was sitting there, pulling these things out of a magic hat or something. It's uh, it's based on scholarly research of the original Hebrew. It's not something he just uh, Romanized, as some people like to say. Um, he had no reason to do that because he knew as well as anyone else that. Christianity is an outgrowth of Judaism, so you can't turn your back on your, your ancestors. Um, so anyway, the warrior's arrows means the gospel, coals red hot blazing would mean application of that gospel, application of the word of God, which is the ultimate defeat or the ultimate weapon against Satan. You live the gospel, he can't control you. Um, and then, alas, that I abide, a stranger in Meshech, and dwell among the tents of Kedar. It's easy here to think that we must know these two locations in the Middle East to be able to understand, but um, most footnotes state that this is just a, uh, a hostile region at the time um, that the psalm, psalmist wrote this. In other words, um, it would be interpreted as just someone who has to live in a hostile environment. Which isn't fun. So he says, alas, woe is me. I abide. I live as a stranger in Mesek. And the supernatural understanding of this, according to Augustine, would be uh, the Christian living in the world. Or the righteous man trying to live among the unrighteous. So we often do feel like strangers in this pilgrimage of ours towards heaven. Um... And so it's painful, it's painful, and uh, the beauty of it is that Christ responds by saying, Blessed are you if you're persecuted for trying to follow God's commandments. Blessed are you who are righteous and are persecuted for his name. Um, so we're not alone in this struggle against the, the lures of a deceptive world. Um, so that's a very powerful, very powerful line there. So it shows that the you know the scriptures are not un unrealistic. They they're very aware of the reality of of daily life. And then it says, "Long enough have I been dwelling with those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for fighting." And so I think most of us who are uh, religious have encountered hostility and hatred when we've tried to bring the gospel of peace to people, or when we try to defend um, defend the gospel. We've often encountered mockery, rejection. Um, maybe we've lost some friends who don't like being around us anymore because we don't like to do the things that they do. Um, and those are just mild comparisons. Now, there are even more extreme scenarios where people are literally uh, under mortal danger because of their faith in Christ. I don't think I need to name where those places are. So... In summary, we have someone who's living in a very uh, nasty environment. It, and and the, the daily application of this song would be, are you in a situation where you wish you could escape? Um, maybe you're in a job that you hate. Um, maybe you're in a marriage that you hate. Maybe you're living in a dysfunctional household, um, a broken home. But here's the good news. If you're 
baptized into Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit can be your peace in no matter what your circumstances are. So meditate on this psalm and um, interp and, and see it in the light of Christ and his sacrifice and his resurrection and how um, if we can survive in a hateful environment with, well, without becoming hateful ourselves, take someone who's trying to follow Christ in a prison. Can you imagine how hard that is to live in a prison with all these criminals um, and trying to live a spirit-filled life? I really, my heart really goes out to people like that. Um, now that's grace in a nutshell right there. Because uh, it would be very difficult to survive that kind of environment without the grace of the Holy Spirit. So uh, this is a good one to pray when you're at, um, when you're beginning your work day. Okay, during that morning break, uh, even if you're not Catholic, open your Bible, turn to Psalm 120. And pray it with faith and let the Holy Spirit guide you to that inner peace that He is ready to give you 24-7. That's all He does is He sits there and is always there ready to help you if you call out to Him. The Holy Spirit that was given to us by the Lord, by the risen Lord Himself. Okay, so to the Lord in the hour of my distress I call and He answers me. O Lord, save my soul from lying lips from the tongue of the deceitful. What shall he pay you in return, O treacherous tongue, the warrior's arrow sharpened, and coals red-hot blazing? Alas, that I abide a stranger in Mesek, dwell among the tents of Kedar. Long enough have I been dwelling with those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for fighting. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. So that's my commentary based on St. Augustine's commentary um, of Psalm 120. I hope you've enjoyed it. Next time we continue, we'll continue with uh, the second psalm from Terrace or Mid-Morning Prayer, um, which will be Psalm 121. This is a popular one because this is the famous one where it says, I lift up my eyes to the mountain from where shall come my help. Um, that will be really interesting, okay? So please pray for me, please pray for this channel, and stay close to God.